So we're going to go into a panel conversation that interacts, that debates. It's really a conversation, as I've said. Dr. Hartwich, what was it that resonated with Professor Ferguson's presentation from your perspective? What is it you'd like to ferret into for a minute or two? Well, Neil, I can say that I really enjoyed your presentation a lot, um, and I particularly enjoyed your comments about econometric modelling and uh, people working at the World Bank and the IMF and their forecasts that are always wrong. Reminds me a bit of that um, joke about economics, um, the two golden rules of economics. For every economist, there's an equal and opposite economist. <laughs> and the second rule, they're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> But that leads me to my question, really. So on the one hand, you're very skeptical about these economic, economists working at the World Bank, OECD, IMF. On the other hand, you cite them as evidence against Brexit. So that doesn't seem to be going to get too well to me. Um, you can't have it both ways. You can't just argue that on the one hand, they always get it wrong, but on Brexit, they're definitely right. And what, why I'm particularly surprised about your stance on Brexit is actually having read your books, because you wrote civilization, you wrote about the great killer apps of Western civilization, and the first killer app you mentioned was competition. Now you've got this monolithic European Union, which is the antithesis, really, of competition, of jurisdictional competition. And I can totally understand your concerns about the dangers of Brexit, but wouldn't you also like to concede that there might be a positive coming out of it. The, the transition will be messy, no doubt about that. But the outcome eventually might be that there is a free market, free trading country outside the European Union that's actually showing people in Brussels how it could really work if you were genuine about free market reforms, free trade, free markets. Wouldn't that be quite an appealing thought to you as a free market economist or economic historian? Well, I'm sure uh, there are many people in New Zealand who, who would uh, celebrate if Britain voted to uh, leave perhaps out of a sense of payback, given that uh, New Zealand was one of the countries essentially betrayed by the British decision to join uh, the uh, then European economic communities. My attitude towards this is not narrowly based on macroeconomics, although I, I've welcomed the IMF's uh, doom mongering. Uh, it's an important part of, of the government's strategy. But it seems to me they're really two key points that, uh, that make it consistent with my work. I was against the single currency. I thought it was an incredibly bad idea. And in the 1990s, I was regarded as a Eurosceptic. So people have been surprised by the fact that I've been advocating uh, that Britain should remain. Uh, and the reason that I'm advocating that is not just that I worry about a sterling crisis, not just that I've been through a divorce myself, so I know that these things are really swift and always costly. Uh, <laughs> and, and this would be the mother of all divorces, <laughs> believe me. Um, the, 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 it's really, uh, I think, to do with the extent to which Britain has been succeeding, really since the 1980s, in shaping the EU in a direction that is healthy. Uh, the single European act that created uh, really quite a major improvement in Europe's functioning was a British idea uh, forced through by the Thatcher government, uh, and it effectively turned the EU from a protectionist racket for inefficient farmers into a massive free trade area in which non-tariff barriers were systematically removed. So the European economy became much more competitive under British pressure. Britain has won a series of arguments since then. We were right about the single currency. We were so right. Mm. It's now clear that we were right. It's also clear that if we joined, it would have been a catastrophe. We were right about Schengen. We were right that completely un, uh, uninhibited movement of people uh, was risky. We were right to stay out. So we've won key arguments within the European institutions. We have become one of the most influential players in the EU, contrary to the nonsense Michael Gove spouts. The UK is very influential in Brussels. It is also very influential in Berlin. There was a time when the French and the Germans ran the show. That is no longer the case. Uh, so the absurdity of, of Brexit is to walk away from our position. In effect, we are on the board, if this were a corporation. We have seats on the board. We are major shareholders. And we're about to walk away. And we won't be compensated. We'll actually be penalized for giving up our power at just the moment when we've won the argument. One last point. History shows that when Britain disengages from the continent, the continent goes to hell in a handcart. 
<laughs> that is a very, very clear lesson of the 20th century. The notion that we could somehow sail off into the Atlantic and drop our anchor somewhere close to Bermuda is absurd. We're stuck there, and the channel is not very wide. The lesson of history is that if Britain remains engaged with Europe, we can stop them doing crazy stuff. They're ready to do crazy stuff again. <laughs> Trust me. The sooner, as soon as we walk out the door, the whole thing gets a whole lot worse. Those are my arguments. They're pragmatic. I don't love the European Union. I find its bureaucracy maddening. But on balance, I think the arguments against it, the arguments for Brexit, are not historically credible and are indeed frivolous and self-seeking in the case of Boris Johnson. Yeah. If I could follow up on your question, there is a lot of debt in the system and um, the major risks that you pointed out are mainly political. But there is, of course, a major economic risk as well. And I think it's in the countries that you mentioned, not just Japan, but especially in Europe. The way that I look at the euro crisis, for example, I focus on the target two imbalance because that's the best barometer you can use. And just as you were talking about inflection points, February, I checked the target two balance and actually it shot up and it's been shooting up and it's actually at levels um, that we haven't seen for three years. So this crisis is by no means over. We've got major problems in all the major continental European economies. I would argue even in Germany, but definitely in France, definitely in Italy, definitely still in, in Spain and Greece, it's completely off the map anyway. Isn't that a major problem? We've got currently about 600 billion euros sitting in target two imbalance debt on the Bundesbank balance sheet. You have to clear that out before you can actually argue that this crisis is over for Europe. With all due respect, Oliver, I'm not convinced that target two is the right thing. I mean, Hans Werner Sinn made a fetish of the number. Uh, but in a monetary union, one should expect that kind of thing. Uh, it's not a sign that the, the system is about to blow up. Everybody said the Eurozone was going to blow up. You, you may remember in 2012, it was one of the many things that Paul Krugman was wrong about uh, that he's forgotten. Uh, but uh, I've reminded him. The, uh, the, the reality is that the system uh, proved to be more stable than uh, the critics, the economists expected. In fact, there are now more members of the monetary union than there were at the beginning of the crisis when I had a very nice bet with somebody that there would be fewer. So this is a system that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't underestimate. The problems, I think, are in Italy, in the banking sector in Italy, for sure. There are some problems in the German banking sector that, uh, that the German government has never really grappled with. Um, and, and Greece, well, I think Greece is going to get fixed, actually, uh, through political transition. I think there'll be a new... Uh, Cyprus will be gone at some point next year. Uh, and I think there's uh, every prospect that the new democracy leader that uh, is now in, in post will be a good, uh, will be a good and effective uh, leader. Uh, in Greece, in the Greek case, there clearly will have to be a haircut, a debt haircut. That's unavoidable. Everybody knows that. It's going to happen. But they don't want to do it for Tsipras. So Tsipras goes and then the deal gets done uh, with the new guy. Spain is in much better shape. Not politically, for sure, but economically, it's going really well. The, the indicators are all uh, looking good there. Portugal, too. So I, I think the European picture is actually quite a mixed one. And one has to be very careful about leaping to the conclusion that it's all about to fall apart. Far too many people did that in 2011, 2012, out of a kind of wishful thinking. Uh, all the people who didn't like the European Monetary Union immediately predicted that it was going to fall apart. I, who never liked it, said it would hang together because the costs of dismantling it were just prohibitively high. And for that reason, I think it lingers on with all its disadvantages. I, I hope, very much hope that I'm wrong. Um, and if I'm wrong, I'll admit it in a couple of years' time. But um, I feel as a gloomy German, I can't share your <laughs> naturally optimistic Scottish view of the world. <laughs> But I really wish that you were right. Um, I just see that there are too many risks, and a few of them, of course, you have mentioned already, and there are, um, it's not just hedging your bets, I mean, these are real risks. And um, I just hope that you are right and that I'm wrong, and in any case, no matter whether you are right or I'm right, New Zealand is still the best place to be. 